Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in Internet Shitlords. And uh, before I get started today, check out the Inappropriate Characters issue episode from uh, last night on the Inappropriate Characters channel. We had Greg Gillespie, creator of Barrow Maze and Dorero Delve, um, guest starring on the show. And it was uh, it was quite a good show. So if you, if you missed it, go check it out. Also, uh, <laughs> check out Sword and Caravan. It's doing very, very well. Uh, Invisible College, World of Last Sun, Old School Companion 2, and all my other games. Um, they're all real games, OSR games you can play that will not, you know, they're not trying to teach you something or claiming to, edu- to, to re-educate you or <laughs> something like that. They're just for OSR gaming, for enjoying playing, and you can use them in, in any variant of, of D&D rules, basically. So uh, be sure to, to check those out. And check out my RPG Pundit Presents series. Um, RPG Pundit Presents number 107, The Northman Sigils, is a complete set of um, a complete set of rules for rune magic to incorporate into your OSR or D&D campaign. So uh, take a look at all of that stuff. <laughs> all right, on to the topic of the day. So I noticed on social media there were some people who were pushing some statistics that were um, apparently picked up in a study by Wizards of the Coast. As it turns out later on, this it, these statistics are not exactly brand new. They're they're actually um, from a year or two ago. So it's not this isn't that isn't like cutting news. It's cutting news that they've somebody posted about it and and it's been it's being talked about right. And uh, I think that was because there was also a website, D and D themed website called Dice Cove that that uh, that stated these statistics among others that that they thought you should know about. So, like, uh, the fact that, you know, the horrifying fact that 4.3 billion minutes of D&D content has been watched on Twitch. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Um, and that it's uh, D&D sales growth were 33% in 2020. Um, we knew that, that, that was, that was mentioned. I, I, I'm very curious to see how, how much sales growth they're going to be having next year, for example. But, uh, but the statistic that was the one that people got to talking about, and that was actually quite interesting. And even the way it's presented, I originally by wizards in this article and on social media is very interesting and see if you can catch it let, let's assume that this study was completely correct. Let's assume that they that there there wasn't any kind of intentional jiggling of numbers or anything like that, right? But check out if you can spot how they are taking correct data and ne- nevertheless manipulating it in certain ways, right? So the um, the the way that they present it is to say uh, Dungeons and Dragons demographic statistics. Uh, for 5th edition, show that 40% of players are age 25 or younger, and only 11% are 40 years or, y- or, or older. Um, so that's, that's the first part. We're going to talk about that, right, first. Because <laughs> there's, there's one other statistic that was a, a big, a, a, an interesting statistic that people were pointing out here. But um, So first of all, you hear that and you go, Jesus, you know, like 40% of 5th edition players are under 25, you know, that's a big deal. And uh, sure, okay, yeah, I get you. And and it is a big deal. It means that there's there has been a lot of interest among young people in um, the D&D hobby. They're, they're into playing it. But uh, in the first place, that's split, right? They're each 25 or younger. That means it's covering everybody from like 11-year-olds who get the game, uh, to you know, people who have now left college, and uh, and it, it's because of that, it doesn't really make a good ex, uh, examination of the divide. Like I would like to see where out of those forty percent, how many of those are under eighteen? You know, like how many of those are actual kids? Because you know, most of the people I know that are my age were kids when they started playing D&D. They were, they're not, not little tiny kids, right? But they were like, you know, between 11 and 14 when they started playing D&D. Those are the, those are the typical ages 
that Gen Xers got into Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm I'm not completely convinced that that's the average age that people are getting into it now. I think that there's been an important demographic shift and that in a way, they're, the way that they're presenting these statistics um, is an attempt to kind of cover that up, okay? Because then you look at the second statistic. The second statistic says 11, only 11% of players are 40 or older, of fifth edition players, right? So that tells you one thing that's very clear, right? They've lost the old school gamers, right? The, the players who are 40 or older are players that are that had played other editions and, uh, and, and had probably played pre-Wizards of the Coast editions. And those people said, well, you know what? Fifth edition isn't for us, right? <laughs> and uh, I, I'm sure a lot of them said it from the start, but I'm sure a lot more of them have been saying it over the last few years. And I'm, I'm betting that if you looked at this statistic today, when remember, this is like somewhere between one and two years old. If you looked at it again today, it, it might be even less. But I'm betting you that the under 25 would also be less. I'm betting you that those people would be, that, that, there would, that it would, because what you'd be having is that they'd be aging out to 25 plus, and they would not be renewing at the teens. And that's, and that's the interesting part um, of that, of those statistics, right? So 11% of players are four-year-old. That means that there's, there's um, effectively they have succeeded. People like Jeremy Crawford have succeeded in creating year zero for RPGs with the D&D fifth edition, because it means that there's nobody who's, who's in that, in that community, as they like to call themselves, that actually remembers what D and D was like when it was really D and D, and not the, this thing that they've that they've manipulated into where adventures are about being baristas at a Starbucks or running around in wheelchair accessible dungeons. Right? They've they've created a a group of gamers who either despised that anyways from the start, right? Or or that have had never had an experience of something like, for example, like Barrow Maze, <laughs> to, to name drop my our guest from inappropriate characters, a real proper, um, a real proper dungeon in the old school style, or or any other type of you know old school adventure, and that have only played in generic D and D land, right? The the land where you know it doesn't matter what you call the world you're playing, whether it's Faroon or whatever the hell Critical Role plays in or anything. It's all just like these multicolor alien non-human entities going around acting like Seattle hipsters and that's it. And, and even the monsters act like that, right? Everything's kind of kooky and, uh, and twee and uh, you don't have, um, you don't have any kind of elements of good or evil. You don't have any kind of mythic struggles, you know, because those things are bad. In fact, they're so problematic. They have to take out <clears throat> good and evil alignment from the monster manual, right? You can't have, you can't say mind flayers are evil. How dare you, bigot? So they've won at that, right? But the part that, that, that is not, there's only one out of three, because they've divided into three categories, right? Under 25, 40 or over. The, the one that they don't actually enumerate is, of course, the 25 to 40 range. And by by default, though, we can know exactly how much it is. It's 49%. It's the largest one. It's the plurality. And I bet that if instead of um, 0 to 25 and then 25 to 39 or 26 to 39 or whatever, um, you had 0 to 18 and then 19 to 25, I bet it wouldn't just be the plurality. It would be a significant majority. I think that a, a large chunk of the under 25 category are actually people that are um, 19 to 25. They're university students, right, from leftist colleges, probably. <laughs> and, uh, and that would mean, so basically, fifth edition is the D&D um, rule set of millennials, right? It's the, it's the millennial version of D&D. It's for the millennial hipsters, for the millennial trust fund babies, for the millennial college graduates. It's for all of the woke activists. Um, it is their edition. It's, and it's an edition that, you know, of course is, is going to reflect their, I was going to say reflect their values, but I mean to say, well, I should really say it's going to reflect their moral and philosophical vacuum, right? The fact that they have a black hole where things like ethics, virtue, 
or religion should be, right? That there's, they've just got this emptiness there that was once occupied by vague Harry Potter memes, but that's problematic too now. So they can't even, <laughs> they can't even connect to that anymore, you know? Uh, and that explains why they have in turn made those people who are, who are also the people in charge at Wizards of the Coast now have made a game that is for them, for rapidly aging millennials, right? Rapidly aging, you know, balding um, hipsters in their in their mid to late thirties you know, <laughs> that are that are, are are just just starting to get to the cusp of that point where they realize that they've basically led meaningless lives, you know, that they've accomplished nothing so far. Um, they're, they're they're all of their uh, activism and independence and uh, demisexuality and whatever else has has left them um, alone, friendless, uh, without a community of anything of any real kind. That's why they care so much about having their D and D community, you know. Uh, and it's and it's it's also starting to dawn on them that everyone hates them, right? That they are the eight percent, right? These people, the people that have that have engineered this game, are the eight uh, percent of the SJWs who now everyone is pushing back against. Um, so in fact, what, while they're trying to claim in the kind of the way they work these completely, let's again, assuming a completely accurate statistics, the way that they present the statistics, and there's always what you have to watch out for when you're looking at any statistic, is how are they presenting it? Because yeah, it could be that it could be just made up outright, but they could be completely honest. But if you present them in one way and present them in a different way, you send a different subtle subconscious message, right? The subtle message they wanted you to think here is D&D is a bunch of teenagers. Yeah, and, and, and part of why they wanted to, to think that is because they want to think, they want you to think D&D is being super successful with the teens and it's therefore, it's a young person thing. And that means you can't criticize it. You can't criticize any of what they're doing because it's what the kids want. They're the new generation. But it's actually what like the 36 year olds want. You know, it's what these, these people, it's my, my millennial younger siblings, right? <laughs> that are, that are, that are just uh, somehow went horribly wrong. No, we don't understand why, you know, it's not, it's not clear. Some people think that it's like a, that it's a generational cycle, right? That, that coincides with the tides of time, you know, <laughs> like there's certain generations that are meant to, to be like, the hero generation, and then there's the kind of lost generation, and then there's the um, the revolutionary generation, and then there's the the individualist generation, and then there's the degenerate generation, right? And then, then it all starts over again, right? Because they, you know, hard times produce strong men eventually. <laughs> so that might be that. It might be something else. It might just be that they're, you know, uh, they had too much too much plastic in, in their, uh, in their chocolate bars or something. I don't know, but it, that it, that it's, it somehow damaged them. And this is the art, this D and D is the, the, uh, fifth edition is the edition of D and D for these damaged people. Um, that, is, that are, that is already, I think on its way out, you know, um, the, and the last statistic, uh, speaking of damage, right. Is that it says, uh, it also says that, uh, where was that? Um, 39% of players identify as female. Okay, so what the hell does that tell us? It, it literally now tells us nothing. It, it's showing us a, a, one of the huge problems of having to try to pretend uh, uh, this make-believe reality that the woke demand that, that, that be imposed on us is... Um, you know, to the point of things like language and things like um, statistics, demographics, right? We're not allowed to know what it means, like to identify as female, right? Because that could mean someone who, who was born biologically female or it could mean someone who isn't. And when you're talking about claiming that 39%, a very large number of the hobby identify as female, well, what the hell does that mean, Right. We know that in earlier editions of D&D, you had um, a smaller percentage. That it, it's, there's, it's a complete lie when the left says, oh, you know, D&D was uh, always hostile to women and there were never, you know, women were never welcome. No, that's, that's not true at all. Right? The, the percentage of people, play, women playing D&D has um, vacillated over the years, um, back and forth, actually, right? Because there were moments where, 
where there weren't, and then there were more, and then there were less, and then there were more, right? Um, and I think I remember, I could be wrong about this, but I think that, like, for example, in the third edition era, it was somewhere around, like at the early third edition era, it was somewhere around 20% of players maybe were women. And and I think later that dropped. Um, but like, uh, you know, it was, it was never much more than 20%. So 39% identify as female for fifth edition could be a monumental demographic shift. It could mean that, that actually um, this version of D&D is much more successful with women, which is itself problematic because that would imply that there are some kind of like fundamental characteristics of men and women, right? That man, male and female is not just something that you that you decide for yourself, but that there's like some kind of basic quality that male or female have that would mean that certain things would be more appealing to men and other things would be more appealing to women. That's, <laughs> I think that's an issue right now, right? Um, but, you know, it could mean that. It could mean that the people at 5th edition have made it um, more acceptable to women and therefore more women have joined uh, because those 39% could be women who are new D&D players. Or a, a big part of that 39% could be D&D players who are now women and weren't before, right? So, so we, without being able to know that, it means that the statistic becomes useless for, because it could mean an enormous change. It could mean that we've doubled the number of women that play D&D or it could mean that we actually haven't changed hardly at all, but what has happened is that a large number of D&D players, for whatever reason, have now begun to identify as women. And those are two different things. I'm sorry, but they are. They're fundamentally two different things, at least on the basis of determining whether there's actually been growth in interest in D&D or not. Putting aside all other political arguments about it, right? Um, whatever else you want to say. This is part of why I say that what we really need to do is have a three gender system. <laughs> like that would that would make things vastly easier, right? Where you could say, you know, where you could recognize there's men, there's women, and there's there's a third, right? There's there's everybody else is something in between, right? That that uh, can choose how they identify. I'm not saying that you can't say that you identify as a woman, but I'm saying that that having a category would be very important for a number of reasons, not least of which is accurate gathering of data. Uh, but anyways, that's, I guess that's everything for today. Um, I think that these statistics do show that D&D that &D is uh, very, very popular. You know, it has grown quite a bit. It grew quite a lot during the pandemic and like, 2020 it grew 33 percent but that's because everybody i think was was at home but there were oh yeah there's one more thing one more statistic that i do think is very interesting because supposedly um we have you know um a a millions of people buying D, &D books right we have a large number of people buying D, &D books and and yet um, we knew, for example, that during the pandemic, in a lot of places, people couldn't physically come together to play D&D, right? So the only place that people could have been playing D&D would have been online. And the thing is, you look at, you know, okay, how many people are playing D&D online on Twitch? Um, we don't know for sure, but, uh, but it's not going to be an enormous amount, right? Um, the, most people who would be playing online, you'd think, would be playing on something like Roll20. Well, in Roll20, you know, the the uh, the numbers are only about, you know, 70,000, you know, something like that. So that leads us to another little problem about the D&D 5th Edition stats and the way they present it. Yes, D&D is enormously successful. I'm not going to I'm not denying that. Um, as a product, it's been enormously successful. As a, as a product brand, it's been enormously successful. Um, but it, there are some little danger spots. I think they're trying to cover over or simply choosing not to, to listen to or not to believe for themselves, you know. And, and one of them is that if you've supposedly sold tens of millions of copies, but only 70,000 people were, were playing online 
uh, you know, during the pandemic, that means that most people are buying the books but not playing the game. And Wizards, I think, doesn't really care that much. They don't care about that. That's, in fact, I think that they know this and have, and have like decided to strategize their marketing in agreement to that, trying to push D and D more as a lifestyle brand and less as something as a game that people play, uh, because a lot of people buy fifth edition books and never get around to playing them or can't play them or are too shy to play them because they're they're millennials, you know, or something. I don't know what's wrong with them, but there we are. So they're, you know, that that means that uh, their their strategy of going towards the lifestyle brand in a way might make more sense if they already knew this because they know that like there are people that are buying D&D to act hip, right? Cuz it, it has been it you know, it, it's I think that might just be at the very start of dying down, but it hasn't died down yet. It's still very much a huge fad. Playing D and D is a fad among millennials, among nerds, but also among like you know people that are on Instagram or whatever, like people and you know internet people, and also you know um, young people, but not probably not teens anymore. I'm not sure. I, I need to know, but I can't be 100 percent sure if there's you know like. Um, if if the the gen if the Gen Zers are actually all that into D and D, you know, and that's going to be a that's going to be the crucial question. And if they are, are they going to want D and D to look the way that the millennials are trying to force D and D to become? Right, like you know, uh, mind flayers are just misunderstood. Um, gender is one of the most important statistics. <laughs> You're going to be spending your 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 sessions doing hardly any combat, but working at fantasy Starbucks. And uh, you know, you, the, the 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 really important thing is you know how your character is going to look and what their pronouns are. <laughs> is that something that Gen Z are going to be excited about playing or not? And if it's not, there's two possibilities. They might want to make the game different or look for alternatives to the game. It'd be great if Gen Zers discovered about the OSR, um, or they'll decide that that's stupid crap, and and the fad will be over, and then you're going to see a bubble burst in Fifth Edition, um, which will be interesting if it does happen. All right. Anyways, that's everything for today. If you like this video, please hit the like button, share it anywhere you think people will find it interesting, or where people are going to get pissed off about it. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And uh, check out all my products because I make my products. I don't have, I, I don't take demographics. You know, I don't have marketing to find out, but I do find out one way, by sales. You know? <laughs> and let me tell you, Sword and Caravan just got me a big fat check this month. So, you know, I'm quite happy with how things are going. And uh, I, I also hear a lot of feedback and people love it and they love all my games. And I thank you guys so much for picking them up. And if you haven't yet, check them out because these are games that are made for you to game with. They are not political. They are something that you're going to be able to use in your D&D. And especially if you're a fifth edition person, check out the OSR. Check out my games and other people's games in the OSR because it is way, actually way more avant-garde, way more creative in how they're using the D and D rules than anything Wizards of the Coast puts out and any, and almost anything I've ever seen on, on like uh, the DMs guild, right? That fifth edition third party products, because there is the, the creative core of, of RPG design has for the last several years been in the OSR, the old school revolution. So we are making games that are like, you know, like the invisible college D and D is the at, the, at the root of the rules but it is actually a a game where you're playing magicians in the modern era and the magic system's totally different. The, the advancement system's a bit different. You've got like all of this stuff that has been made. You, it, it, the, the, the rules are familiar because if you know D&D, you'll know how these rules work, but it's all been adapted to fit the exact setting and the settings aren't all the same, right? Sword and Caravan, Invisible College, World of the Last Sun, the... Lion and Dragon, European Default, whatever you want to call it. The, all of those are different. And they're not just generic fantasy land the way D&D 5th Edition is. So take that in mind. And I mean, like, really different, right? They each have different zeitgeists. They have different paradigms that you that um, you are meant to involve yourself with, you know? So check that stuff out. Check out my RPG Pundit Presents PDF series if you want a taste of that. They just cost, you know, between $0.99 cents and four ninety nine. So it's like you're 
buying me a coffee or something or a chocolate bar. I don't know what, uh, but uh, you know, you're getting something in return. So take a look at all that. And uh, thank you very much. Currently smoking Peterson um, poker plus Argento natural. <laughs>